Welcome to the Power Hour. Do I sound roomy? Yeah, but it's, it's, it's fine. Have you seen this thing about Kentucky passing a law or proposing a law that makes it a misdemeanor to... Insult police. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Man, that is, some, that is some snowflake shit. Yeah, it's pretty insane. I, I was trying to figure out how I wanted to word my, my tweet response, and I ended up saying nothing because it's just ridiculous. Basic, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like if it would insult the com- a common person, if it would cause them to react possibly violently towards you, then that's, that's like the definition. Mm-hmm. It's a thought crime. It's pre, pre-assault. Or... Pre-assault, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's insane. You know, and, and the most reasonable response that I saw was, well, I guess the reasonable response would be just anything opposing it. But it was just like, why, why are we holding these people to a lower standard than the average person? Right. Um, I guess we should just probably dive right in because I don't know how long this is going to take. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of It's Always Stockholm in Los Angeles. My name is Nate Harold. I'm here with the early riser, the early bird, Chicken Dad 69, Will Noon. I'm going to get that worm. He's going to get that worm, folks. It is, what time is it for you? It's like not even six o'clock yet, right? 5.45 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes we have to make, we have to do extraordinary things to make this podcast happen. Mostly because, mostly, will. <laughs> mostly because my life is a weird, weird mess. I don't understand how I find myself in these situations constantly, but it happens. It, it keeps things interesting for sure. It's like a, it's like an obstacle course. Yeah. My life is an obstacle course and it doesn't need to be. This is like a self-inflicted wound. Would you, do you think you would be happy if your life wasn't as much of an obstacle course? Yes. <laughs> okay. Never, never mind. I was just going to see if maybe there was some sort of like benefit keeping, keeping the mind moving, but maybe not. I mean, it's perfectly possible. I always make the joke that now I'm retired. I'm just going to die soon because that's what happens. So maybe it's keeping me alive, but making me miserable. So I don't know. It was like a... Well, yeah, yeah hopefully yeah, no, yeah. nobody wants to do a paternity test and lets out a lot of your blood. Yeah, I, I don't think I can handle it. Anyways, today we are talking about Season 3, Episode 7 of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, The Gang Sells Out. Yeah, for a second, while we were discussing this episode before I started watching it, I thought this was the one where they turn the bar into that hip bar, but... That's the one, I think, when they're trying to get, like, the best reviews. The better than an orgasm episode. That is the gang desperately tries to win an award. Right, right. There's also the episode where they turn it into, like, a speakeasy. Hmm. And then there's also an episode where they get a terrible review and they try to get a better review. Oh, yeah. I was going to say they... They kidnap the They kidnap the guy. The, yeah. Yeah. I think someone needs to feed his cats. Right. Wrong cat. Yada, yada, yada. So, anyways, basically, this episode, um, the gang gets an offer from a, a corporate uh, stooge, I believe is what he's called, to buy out their bar. It's initially met with resistance, and quickly that resistance is disappeared by a piece of paper with a big number on it, and hilarity ensues. Yeah, basically. Uh, you know, then they try to, they, the offer gets taken away, they try to sabotage the site that the corporation ends up purchasing. Um, There's a street gang. Dee and Charlie have to get jobs because they're not owners, technically. Right. Corporate drone, that was the word. Yeah, corporate drone. Uh, I think they call him a fat cat at one point. (laughs) I don't know if he's the fat cat, but there is, like, in every one of these corporate buildings, there, there is a fat cat. Right, or multiple fat cats. It's true. Which is why they need a helicopter pad on the roof. Right. So I guess, yeah, that just takes us to the first scene of the episode, which is a kind of an uh, what becomes a classic Always Sunny thing. I think we've talked about it before, and I'm sure it's happened already in the series, where they're having a discussion amongst themselves, and the person is either unexpectedly there or unexpectedly disappears. Right. And in, in this first instance, the uh, corporate drone is unexpectedly in the room while they're having this hilarious conversation. Right. It's a, it becomes a classic trope uh, where, yeah, they do a five-minute, not a, 
it's a five minute dialogue amongst themselves. And then you cut to the other side of the room and we realize, Oh yeah. Awkwardly. He was standing there the whole time. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a debate about whether or not the building they're in has a helipad, uh, whether or not there are secret tunnels, um, a monorail, I think is thrown out there at one point. Well, the, the secret tunnels, I think go down to the monorail system. Oh, yeah. I see. I they're see. Not, I see. That makes They're sense. not walking yeah. around down there. That's a, that's a good point. Um, I think, I think, uh, Max great when he wraps it up because Dennis is, obviously not into this he's like no there's no helipad there's no helicopter what are you talking about uh charlie is convinced that all this is happening and max says okay we're split on the helicopters we'll come back to the secret tunnels i think, I think we that should was an excellent I think we idea better. but i think we'd all agree that conversation is not over yet so that's that's when after discussing you know these fat cats and talking very much in the you know about someone they Say, okay, sir, you were saying. Yeah, the corporate drone is sitting there the whole time, played by, uh, his name is Richard Rucolo. Rucolo? Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, man, this guy, I feel like I've seen this guy in a, a bunch of stuff, but I don't know what. He starred in a sitcom called Two Guys, a Girl, and a Pizza Place. Do you remember that show? The or name it was sounds familiar, later called, but... Later called Two Guys and a Girl, I think. Yeah, it's whatever. I was just watching some clips of it right before you joined the meeting. And uh, yeah, it's like a 90s, maybe late 90s sitcom. Ryan Reynolds is in it. Very young Ryan Reynolds. Cool. He's the other guy. He's one of two guys. Yeah, he's one of two guys. But uh, yeah, Richard Rucolo is a great actor. This is not his only appearance and it's always sunny. Do you think it's done on purpose or am I just racist against white people? But does he remind you of... The Israeli guy and... A, 100%. But also a little bit of the lawyer. Obviously, the lawyer is like a definitive character, but yeah, but they're they're similar to the lawyer, but I don't know. Maybe it's white people in suits, but yeah, yeah, he reminds me so much of the Israeli guy. The Israeli guy is in WandaVision. Did we, did we already talk about that? I don't think so. You've watched WandaVision, right? I have. He's like the 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 bad. I don't know what is he CIA. I'm not sure what oh, exactly he is. The 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 he main looks great. The FBI douche. Yeah yeah ex- FBI yeah. Or he much. looks he he looks awesome for it being 15 years after we last saw him on Always Sunny. Right right. Yeah and he's just playing kind of kind of the same part. Powerful. Right. Douchebag. Yeah yeah. Oh, well, I mean. Was he a douchebag in the Always Sunny thing? Because... Uh, well, I mean, I'm looking at it from the gang's perspective, so... Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, true. Fair enough. And he did, he did fence them in. He put up a wall. And he also uh, had some sort of a romantic relationship with Frank's wife. I mean, that's not... That's within the bounds of, of fine taste or whatever, yeah. but... Barbara is a very attractive woman. She was. Rest I mean, in peace. I mean, she's dead now. But yeah. also, from the gang's perspective, you know, Mac Banger. Ah, that's a good point. Anyway. He's extremely conflicted about it. <laughs> sort of. Well, yeah, he's conflicted until Charlie bends his mind. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, okay. So, moving on. So, yeah, that's when the cor- corporate drone says, okay, cool, we want to buy your bar. And they're like, they laugh it off because of their disdain for the man and corporate fat cats. So he graciously says, okay, well, why don't you just humor me and take a look at our offer? He slides the classic folded piece of paper with the number on it across the desk. And as they're laughing and saying, sorry, buddy, you know, Patty's isn't for sale. We have integrity, blah, blah, blah. Dennis immediately opens the piece of paper, smiles and points at it while saying sold. Yeah. It's a classic cut to the title screen. Really, really well done. Okay, so my question to you, Will, is what number do you think that was? Yeah, that is a good question. So from the recently mentioned Israeli takeover, do we think that the gang owns the physical, like the land? Right. They, yeah, that's that. I also had that thought, like, what exactly are they buying? Yeah. Um, So that's my question. Are they buying out the lease, which is another 25 years? Or are well, they buying the stab like or are they buying like the building? Frank bought it, if you recall. Mm-hmm. He bought it from the Israeli guy. So I mean right. but between Frank owning the property and I guess the guys owning the business. Right, right, right. 
But they, I guess, yeah, I guess they own because Frank bought the the Israeli guy's land, yes. so he owns half of the bar. Land. Oh, I thought he. I thought yeah, you're right because he does come in at the end and measure it. Yeah, you're right. But but does that mean that the guys own the other part of the bar? Let's maybe. Should we assume they do? Let's just say they do because this would be too complicated <laughs> to figure out. I mean, it's still too complicated. I have no clue, but uh, we're talking 2007? Yeah. All right. Can we pinpoint this? Is this before or after the crash? Because like This is before. 2007, 2008, that was the moment. Um, right, because the, the mortgage crisis does come up later. Right, okay. Okay, so, so it's like peak times. Um, Philadelphia is very cheap. Mm-hmm. It's like not, I mean, not an expensive city. Um, let's see. It's, it's a double wide property, you know, um, mm-hmm. uh, I'd say the number is, the number is big enough that it also convinces Frank immediately. Yeah. After also showing resistance, much like the guys. Um, oh, okay. We have to talk about the labyrinth of the basement. Oh because yeah. How it, it, does it go like three floors down? Also the, the, not the basement, but the second floor and the third floor of the building. The Charlie's we've, bad room. Yeah. Well, we've like the when you see an establishing shot, the actual physical outdoor location of the right, bar, right. there's three floors. Yes. I mean you could call Charlie's bad room, but Charlie's bad room is like a tiny, like unfinished let's, attic space. Let's pretend that part doesn't exist. Okay. Let's just call it what it is on the interior shots. I'm saying over five hundred thousand. I was gonna say a million. Just yeah. because it was like the, a number that was big enough that got them so fast. And then Frank, yeah, <laughs> basically the same speed. And he's like the, the warthog, you know, so he would. Right. I, it, it's a number big enough to just drop his jaw. I, I agree because I guess I was like sort of slowly valuing the, the land being in Philadelphia at the time. I would say 500, 700,000, like somewhere in that range for a shitty dilapidated one story. Mm-hmm. Like functional, but but messy. Uh, so yeah. Right. So if you were to like double that, yeah, I'd say over a million bucks. Yeah, I, I agree. Because it seems like the Oldies Rock Cafe slash the parent company, which is called like Media Restaurants or something like that. I forget exactly what it's. It's something, something I don't very know. stupid. But uh, yeah, so it's like a TGI Fridays slash Hard Rock Cafe combination. Yeah, I would say. Uh, wait, which, um, what company has flair? That is TGI Fridays. Okay. Yeah. I think. Yes. Or is that Applebee's? I think it's TGI Fridays. I don't think it's Applebee's. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's TGI Fridays. Right. So, uh, we got ahead of ourselves, but they go back to the bar. They're all talking about selling the bar. Frank is adamant that he's not going to sell the bar. There is no way I'm selling the bar. Oh. D chimes in and kind of fantasizes about retiring to an island and getting fat and tan. Yep. And that's where we uh, learn of the uh, Enron-esque structure of Patty's Pub. D, you're not going to get shit. No. Yeah, come We're on. We're the shareholders. You owe nothing. Are you serious? I have been with you guys since the very beginning. Which is a cut and run yeah. style, uh, you know, executives only benefiting from this right which d is not an owner she's just an employee right who's like maybe paid maybe not never really super clear yeah they do mention paying her at some point but it does seem like maybe tips are the main part of her well whatever no one makes any money right so this leads to as we mentioned before frank seeing the number immediately saying that we should sell this piece of shit bar let's sell uh, this leads to one of the great scenes in this episode. Uh, they're talking about being wooed. Yeah. So when when Frank sees the number and says, let's sell this piece of shit bar, uh, the guys are like, all right, let's go down there right now and, and sign some papers. Do it. And Frank interrupts and says, no, no, no. We have to milk this cow for all she's worth. We need to be wooed. Oh. Which Mac and Dennis... And Charlie all get excited about this. They agree. They get, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, wooed. All right, here we go. Charlie kind of chimes in subtly with like, okay, yeah. I'm just saying, I can go for some wood. 
Uh, no, we're saying wood. Yeah. Get some wood. Maybe we'll build something, a little cabinet, and then, <laughs> then we'll go get paid. Um, which could, you know, is a, is a little expansion on, uh, you know, is a literacy and they, they move into it with not understanding how it's like, we're not going to get wood. We're going to be wood. It's a different word. And he's like, come on, how could you be wood? It doesn't right. make sense. Uh, with the knowledge of Charlie's, uh, illiteracy, learning disability, like it's not out of the question that he, he would hear the word wood and think of W O O D. Right completely plausible you're also talking about a city in which we we call water water exactly so there, yeah. there's a lot of things going on they never really finish the wood wood uh debate but they just decide to go down back to the corporate drones office and see what see what else they can milk out of this situation and d is left i believe literally in the dark i was gonna say the same thing yeah they walk out and turn off the lights which I I, for, I wanted to rewind and check, but are there other customers in the bar? Like they're Pro- probably they're probably. open. They just, Chances are yes. Although I guess in their defense, they're just going to sell their bars. So who cares? Yeah, who cares? They're gonna gut the place. It's gonna be like a tacky restaurant. None of the regulars are probably gonna be sticking around. The next scene is inside the Oldies Rock Cafe, where D goes um, with the intention of getting a job. Yeah, because you know obviously. They're, which is funny because she's getting a job at the place that they're turning her bar into. Right. Yeah. It's a little weird that she picked like the nearest location, but I guess it was just cause like it was on her mind. Oldies rock cafe. Yeah. Maybe she was doing some, in, you know, researching and getting some Intel. Right. Uh, she asked the, uh, the host for an application and there's a really funny scene where he's like, right. Just fill out this application, and I'll put it in the stack with the others. That guy goes on to play Duncan in several other episodes, that actor. Oh. I, I read that, but I don't remember Duncan because I David keep... David Guerrera, Guerrera. Guerrera. David Guerrera. I keep thinking Duncan is Z. Right. Well, cause they thought Z was Duncan also when they first met him. Oh, nice. Yeah, so D is sort of applying for a job, but the the host makes it abundantly clear that it's not worth even filling out an application. Right. Uh, which is when the waitress comes over, seemingly excited to see D, which I thought was odd. A little weird. Yeah. Yeah. They seem. I guess maybe it's early enough in her dealings with the gang that she's sort of excited still, or she has some sort of naive hope about. Dennis, at least. You know, so D flips it and says, oh, you're working here. This is so great. Yeah, so why don't you get me a job? Oh, manager. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think uh, my favorite line from this interaction is when uh, Dennis is like, oh, you're not working at the coffee shop. She's like, oh, I am working at the coffee shop still, but Starbucks moved in right across the street, so my hours got cut, and, yeah. you know, it's, it's been rough, so I had to pick up a second shift. D's response is... Right across the street? Well, that is good to know. I love Starbucks. D being callous and shitty, just like the rest of them. Right, and then continuing to do so by asking the waitress to fill it in the application for her. Yeah, she just railroads her, says, oh, that's great, you can do this, you can give me a job. I'll just, uh, I'll head to the bar and I'll, I'll uh, wait for you to, f- to finish this up and I'll get some training going and we'll do this. This is going to be great. And as she walks away, the, the waitress is like, did you go to high school, I guess? Which is a little weird because they went to high school together, as we later learn. It is weird, but also, is it? Wait, oh, actually, that's the opposite. If D didn't know she went to high school with the waitress, that would make sense. Oh, yeah, it would but be the opposite. You're but, right, you're but right. the waitress should know. Right, she should definitely know. I feel like that's a weird plot hole. Because it's a little loosey-goosey until, like, season eight. Yeah, basically. you... Because in all of these interactions, you would think that that would come up more often. Right. Anyway, so the, the guys and Frank are back at the office of the corporate drone, and they kind of lay out their terms for the sale. Right. And they have some great ones. Uh, there's a mention of a plaque, or if maybe not a plaque, then a statue. But something uh, classy. Like yeah. when, when the dudes are holding up the flag on that one war. Little confusion about the World War II. The interesting thing to me is that when Charlie starts talking about the helicopter flyby, which is 
Yeah. It seemed pretty innocuous to me. Like, they probably don't have a helicopter. I would like a helicopter flyby. I don't need to be in it. I just want your corporate chopper to fly by my apartment window real low and fast. That's it. It's just kind of a silly thing that he's saying, but that is the straw that breaks the corporate camel's back. Right. I, I think it's super adorable. Yeah, it is. It is a very childish thing um so the yeah the corporate drone uh rescinds the offer uh, and then there's some great backtracking with the gang saying oh we'll just take the original deal and then that works into we'll take something substantially less right and uh, it's a it's a nice reverse negotiation yeah and uh he is not having it and that's the end of that offer well my favorite part to backtrack just a little bit is where they sure keep going uh, on the, the statue of the dudes holding the flag from that one war, and then they discuss what yes. war it is. And it's like, they somehow get into, um, someone says, oh, no, 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 that's when we dropped the, the bomb on Japan. And Charlie freaks out, and he's like, what? Why would we do that? They're our friends. They make all yeah. of our cars. They discuss that. Frank admits how he, he only buys American cars, which I think... Maybe a thing, because he does seem to have, like, big luxury cars. I feel like yeah, he's in, yeah, like, a that. town car or a Cadillac exactly. or something. A Lincoln. Yeah. yeah. So, and I feel like Dennis says... Yeah, you're making a big mistake, Frank. See, Japan makes the best cars. Yeah. Well, in Germany. We know what he drives. Which is funny, because he's quoting the Japanese and the German cars, but he drives a Land Rover, which is British. Yeah, he skipped, he skipped a big one there given his attachment to that car. But again, it's a little loosey-goosey maybe up until... Not really. He's been... We've seen the car. I guess it hasn't been a big thing yet, but yeah, we. I mean, he ran people over. Yeah. You know? maybe, he, maybe he hasn't developed his attachment yet. Yeah, because it's still relatively... It's like 10 years old at this point or something like that. Yeah, but I'm right. just... Uh, yeah, probably. But I'm just saying like, you know... We haven't seen him in, like, some serious trials and tribulations with it. Right. So, Going through his audio sex tapes. Uh, you know, like, proving that it's a, an amphibious vehicle. Right, right. Uh, okay, so that's a bust. So they, bust. they walk outside. Is that when they argue outside? Or are we skipping? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just going to say that it's a, little, uh, it's a little jarring because they're actually, like, on location outside somewhere which is just such a kind of a rare thing at this point right right i think it's awesome when uh when they start to realize that charlie shouldn't even be in these negotiations <laughs> because he he gave half his shares to mac at one point you sold me half your shares of the bar for goods and services and he also sold half his shares to dennis wait, wait, wait a second you've definitely given me half your shares too dude and then max says well you sh you sold a shit ton of shares to me for half a sandwich yeah i was gonna say he had two great things in there he says yeah well, maybe i gave you guys a couple shares and my back was against the wall i need a little breathing room so i i i liked when he says is this a hose job are you hosing me down <laughs> yeah that was pretty great. <laughs> Hose job. Uh, because basically they're like, you know, pulling that card, which is funny because it's like, I don't know, did you sell your... It's pretty black and white, it seems. Right. He either has the shares or didn't. Um, right. And that's when he goes into his job cannon diatribe, which is awesome. Oh, get a job? Yeah. Just get a job? Why don't I strap on my job helmet and squeeze down into a job cannon and fire off into job land where jobs grow on jobbies? Um, and he storms off. And so Charlie's out, and Frank and Mac and Dennis are going to try to do something to get the deal back. For better or worse, their plan, their initial plan, is to woo the corporate drone. Yeah, since since they didn't get wooed, they need to woo him. Right, so they take him to a strip club. He thought they were going to dinner, but, you know, I think the line is, who doesn't like looking at naked women while drinking beer? Gay man, for one. <laughs> huh? Which leads to a... Quite frankly, legendary uh, scene of Always Sunny, where they are discussing the, uh, phew, how would you even say that? The dynamics of gay relationships? Um, gay, Is that what you would call it? Like it's, gay archetypes in a weird way? Yeah. <laughs> like, or, or like hierarchy or structuring or classification system like, or... Weird, stereotypical roles. Basically... Right. They find out that the man that they brought to a strip club to woo him is gay. And then they discuss 
very, very pointed, like, oh, you, we would have never guessed. We didn't, we didn't know. And then they're like, oh, they get into a discussion of twinks versus bears with very limited knowledge. And then they're, you know, Mac is, is referencing how he would be a bear. A uh, twink is small and slender, like Mac. Oh, no. I'm too muscular. I would be a bear. Uh, don't think so, bro. Not hairy enough. Smooth. And then I guess they can't figure out what he is, but then Frank says, well, I would be a bear because I'm hairy. Like, well, no, you're too small. And they don't get much further, but, but because I think Frank at that point says, well, I'd definitely be a top. And then they get right. into the top versus bottom discussion as to where Frank has some questions, and Dennis seems to be the expert on all things Speed has everything to do with it. <laughs> uh, it's a great interaction where they kind of have no clue what they're talking about. Not that I do. Like as It's entertaining right. for me because I don't know what they're talking about, but I also know that they don't know what they're talking about. Right. You could assume that they're probably wrong, but it's, yeah, right. it's really funny and like crazy detailed and a really f- just funny bit of dialogue, right. which leads to the reverse of the... First scene right. where they're talking and they haven't noticed that the corporate guy left. You see, the speed of the bottom informs the top how much pressure he's supposed to apply. Speed's the name of the game. Right, buddy? God damn it. And there's a great, you know, pan over to his chair and he's gone. So as they're pontificating, the corporate drone sneaks out. Uh, so then we see, we go back to D working right. at the Oldies Rock Cafe. She's got the gear on, the suspenders and the green polo, polo shirt, shirt yeah. she's, khakis. She's flared up. This is where I think, is this where Charlie comes in? Yeah, Charlie. Charlie hit rock bottom. Yeah, so Charlie comes in. <laughs> he's like, like pretty yeah. funny way of describing it. Well, I hit rock bottom and I need a job. I guess the waitress comes up to yell at Dee probably for not doing her job or to stop drinking on the job. Yeah, I think she's tr- training her and talking about like refilling ketchup and oh, stuff like that. Oh, right, and she's right. Like, yeah, I'll just take it from someone else's table. And yeah, Dee's just being the worst. And yeah, unsurprisingly. So, they, yeah, Charlie comes in looking for a job. Yeah, so, so Charlie is very interested in this waitress situation because the waitress is the assistant manager. So, basically, I don't know how this works. They just kind of steamroll her once again, and she sort of agrees to get do the job because. He's like, I'll do anything. And D supports that and says, yeah, I mean, he'll he'll clean the hell out of a toilet. He's like, okay, you know what? Maybe the waitress is threatening him. She's like, okay, you, you're going to clean the shit and the vomit and this, yeah. that. And he's like, okay, yeah, no problem. Oh, oh she mentions he's going to put out grease fires. Deal oh, with like, human, bl- like, yeah, calling his bluff, basically. Yeah, being yeah, like what she's doing. human yeah. vomit, cleaning up human shit, grease fires, blood. He's like, okay, yeah, no problem. I got you. I'm going to take care of that. You're not going to believe how good of a job I'm going to do. And so he runs off to get a beer and she's like, oh, and you also, you can't drink. They ignore that. And <laughs> my favorite line that he wraps this up with is, I got to get a beer and then take the edge off and then I'll get started doing the fires or whatever you want me to start. What was it? Uh, such a good line. And next we, we go forward a little bit in time to where Dee is actually working a shift uh, she has to come into the waitress's office to have a meeting about she's putting down some, the wrong ticket on certain tables. And D explains that she's double dropping. She does it all the time. It's great. She pockets the cash. It's called D's it double drop. Yeah. The, <laughs> D's double drop. Right. And you know, this is where the waitress complains because it's her job and she needs her job and she could get fired. Uh, my favorite line from this interaction is, you know what? I'm not asking you to do much. Just, uh... Just turn a blind eye while I rob this place stupid. No. Yes, so good. Uh, yeah, D, D is kind of uh, steamrolling the waitress because the waitress is like, you know, if you do this, I'm going to have to fire you. And she brilliantly pulls out the card of... No idea why Dennis thinks you're so cool. Um, did you say that Dennis thinks I'm... <gasps> so now the waitress is tiptoeing around it and saying like, okay, well, I'll let it go this time, you know, because I'm cool. Just hoping that she gets uh, some some inroads with Dennis. Charlie comes in to also berate D on her poor waitressing job, and he's he looks great in the uniform, the sleeves rolled up. I'm guessing because he's been cleaning up vomit and shit and stuff. Yeah, you gotta he's got, go a, got a rag over his over his shoulder. Yeah, and there's just a really great interaction between all three of them. Where Char- it's like Charlie and the waitress. Charlie aligns himself with the the waitress, like. <laughs> 
figuratively and literally. Yeah. Um, where he, he's like, he goes into, I don't know. He goes into like put his hand on her shoulder and she like cringes and flinches away. And he's like, yeah. Oh no, I was just like leaning out. And I thought you, I was reaching out here and you just kind of like seemed like you were about to lean in. She's like, no, I was not doing that. Man, we are just smoking through this, but we've only got 20 minutes left. Perfect. Uh, so next scene, we're back at Patty's, um, where Frank is wearing a leather jacket, uh, with a bumblebee on the back. Uh, and he's playing pool with a bunch of old men dressed just like him and Dennis and Mac come in and are perplexed as to what the fuck is going on. Uh, I, I love everything about this. The Frank brought together, he, you know, Frank grew up on the streets, so he brought his old street gang back. Mm-hmm. The Yellow Jacket Boys, he got a tip that the restaurant bought the bookstore down the street, so they're going to go just, I guess, harass people out in front of it and just uh, hang out and loiter and yeah. try to make it look like there's a seedy underbelly. Right. I think Dennis finds this idea kind of stupid, but... Mac is like, no, wait, wait. Yeah, that might work. If if they think the new place is like in a sketchy neighborhood, maybe they'll back into the deal. Right. So it's worth a shot. What else are right. they going to I do? mean, yeah. I mean, Dennis is 100% right in this. I mean, and I understand why Mac's saying it's a good idea, but it, it's not a good idea to use the Yellow Jacket Boys. I don't know no. if that's the correct <laughs> approach. But um, so Dennis heads back to the Oldies Rock Cafe because he need they need... Um, charlie and d back because they're not selling the bar right or dennis is convinced that they're not selling the bar at this point right they need someone to actually do the work um and that's where dennis like sees a bunch of college girls or something he's like whoa are there, <laughs> yeah. bun- are there always so many girls in here and yeah. uh d seems to be like talking it up i guess she's doing well with her double drop because yeah i guess that makes sense there's no one in patty's ever so she's probably making a killing at a right. restaurant where the actual patrons exist. And, I mean, she probably wants to, like, stick it to him a little bit because... Right, right, right. You know, they were dicks to her. Yeah, so, so she wants to be I, like, I'm I doing see. so well, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, the D tells Dennis about the double drop, and he's like... Oh, you're doing the double drop here, too, huh? You know about this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We always used to take the difference out of your purse. Dennis wants to get a job. D's like, yeah, I'll send in the manager to do an interview with you. Right. And sends charlie back there Mm -hmm. um because they're they're you know spat in the face by dennis and mac and frank so they're gonna try to like you know punch back yeah yeah punch back a little bit so so dennis is sitting in the office and charlie comes in like you know he's a busy restaurant manager and it's time to do the interview and pretends like he doesn't know dennis and asks him to like describe patty's pub Uh, yes tell me more about this patty's pub Hey, sorry for keeping you waiting. It's busy out there tonight, man. So, Charlie Kelly, nice to meet you. Uh, I understand you are looking for a bartending position. He wants to know about his responsibilities, uh, which is going hilariously until the waitress shows up and, of course, is just, like, tongue-tied and in love with Dennis. And he just does what everyone else does to her and just steamrolls her into right. giving him a job. Well, she needs a little less steamrolling in this situation. She's, like, more than happy to do it. Yeah. It yeah. seems. And then there's another all-timer sunny scene uh, outside of the bookstore where the Yellow Jacket boys are playing jacks, I think, <laughs> is what they're playing. Yeah. Uh, which is really funny. Um, well, they're a 1950s they're, street gang, you know? It makes yeah, sense. They they are having so much fun. Mac is kind of like, this is not... This is not the vibe I wanted to cultivate out, outside of this. This is not the intimidating right. uh, factor we need uh, for this plan to work. That's where the family walks up and, and asks if, oh my God, is this like a, a doo-wop group? This is so great. Do they, do they sing songs? And Mac's like, what? What are you talking about? Of course they don't sing songs. Like, that's insane. Is, it's a street gang. Come on. <laughs> and Frank's like, what are you talking about? Of course we are. Yeah, it's 1950s street gang. Of course we sing songs. You guys sing? Of course we sing. We're a gang. No, no, no. Gangsters don't sing. What are you talking about? You ever hear a gangster rap? So Max livid because they're not going to intimidate anyone while they're entertaining crowds. Uh, but they bust out a really great acapella 
doo-wop song. Yeah, the song is about um, how the Yellow Jacket Boys can steal soda pop because they uh, they like to get into street fights, so everyone's afraid of them. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing the lyrics, of course, but... Um, uh, I think Frank... It's funny because Frank seems to be just like mouthing the words, doesn't really right, know right, what right. he's doing, which is awesome. Did you know the the yellow jacket boys are actually the mighty echoes a very i did popular yes. uh doo-wop band yeah i looked them up yeah they got their start in silver lake interesting yeah interesting at, at the oleo theater which i've never heard of no um but it d- didn't happen in the uh 50s it happened in like the late 80s early 90s i mean that kind of makes sense they're not like 100 years old except for uh hockey <laughs> Hockey, hockey is 110 years old. He's pretty old. Anyways, back to the oldies rock cafe. Dennis is having a great time bartending. Like he probably bartends at Patty's, uh, where he's taking shots with girls and getting mm-hmm. drunk and just having a blast. Getting phone numbers. Wait, getting phone numbers. Yeah, and the waitress is like, "What are you doing? Like, you can't be drinking." And he, I'm a bartender. I'm, all I do is drink. D lets it slip that she's still double dropping and. The waitress is just like, oh my God, like I'm being completely taken advantage of here. I don't know what to do. In comes the white knight, Charlie. He's yeah. like, hey, what's going on here? You seem stressed. What's, yeah, what's up? Hey, what's going on over there? Are you all right? I'm not all right. Dennis and Dee are being complete ass faces. Uh, Charlie offers to kind of take care of the problem. Like, I don't know if he spe- says specifically what he's going to do, but, you know, he's just like, let me handle this. Let me handle this. And, she, you know, the waitress is like, emotionally vulnerable at this point so he's like let's let's have a hug which is very a very big deal for charlie right this is like this is it uh and she agrees you know she reluctantly but like you know he he has been really good to her in this role like he's doing everything he needs to do he takes her side he's supporting her when she needs it so she agrees to the hug they go in for it and my favorite part of the scene is when uh when they're finished with the hug you know, it's a little longer than she would have wanted, but she says, why are you sweating? Wow, why are you so sweaty? It's really hot in here. It's not hot, it's freezing. It is freezing, isn't it? They're blazing that AC. But he got he got what he's desired. That evening, I guess, uh, Frank, Mac, and the Yellow Jacket Boys show up at the corporate guy's house, right. um, trying to, you know, bring the intimidation to his doorstep, literally. And Frank's like, you know, if you if you don't buy this, if you don't buy our bar, Hockey's going to take care of you. And Hockey is by far the oldest member of the Yellow Jacket Boys. Right. Um, Doesn't ever really say anything, I don't think. No. He's just very old. And uh, so the executive kind of calls their bluff, and he's like... Is that right? You got something to say, old man? (laughs) Uh, So good. So then we have back at the Oldies Rock Cafe, uh, Dennis is bragging about how many phone numbers he's getting, and D is even D is impressed with that. Guess what? I just topped myself for most phone numbers in one day. Nine. Nine? Nine. Come on. And Charlie comes in and is like, I called corporate. Like, you guys are going to get fired. When, when this news is getting to Dennis, he, he does this really funny, like, oh, no, sweet baby, no. Why would you do that to me, sweet baby? No. <laughs> yeah. Babe, don't do that to me. I feel like we were getting so close, sweet baby. <laughs> and then that's when the uh, the waitress is like, do you even know my name? And he says, yeah, of course I do, beautiful. Oh, my God. Um, he's like, what? I call you beautiful because you are. That's you. Yeah, you don't want to be called beautiful? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, the corporate drone comes in it's the same guy of course um and he tells them he like listen here's the thing i had a really strange night last night your friends in their doo-wop group they showed up in my house and attacked me one of them died on my doorstep and it just it sort of put me in a funk yeah i'm just gonna clean house you're all fired and the waitress is like ha ha yeah you guys got fired it, i'm not fired it's, right? it's really i don't know if it's important but i like the fact that she kind of takes a step towards him and turns so the you know the fat cat and her are like seemingly like a uh, unified front. She it's like, like when take... Charlie when Charlie is yeah 
confronting D about her tables and the sugar packets, like he aligns himself with the waitress. Right. Now she's aligning herself with the executive. Yeah. And, and, uh, very, um, Stockholm syndrome D when she does the same thing, she like migrates to the side and assumes that she's with the McPoyles. Uh, right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. A lot of this. So yeah. So the waitress steps over and says, yeah, you guys all pack it in. You're gone later. And he's like, uh, I'm sorry, did you hire these people? <laughs> yeah. Well, then you are a terrible manager because they're all psychopaths. So you're definitely fired. Very similar to Gun Fever when Dave Foley, the principal, is like when Charlie puts the kid in blackface. Uh, and Dave Foley's like, well, I hired you, so I'm probably going to get fired too. <laughs> right. And the final scene of this episode is outside of Patty's in the alley. Also kind of an ever-morphing alley, sort of. Yeah, a little bit. Not as much as the basement, but uh, they're having a bit of a memorial service for hockey. And there's a big Lebowski-style bit where they put the ashes in the fire and they blow into everyone's face. And right. And Mac even, like, spits after it, which is really funny. And they sing a beautiful song about hockey. Um, yeah, and it does seem like Frank knows the words to this one a little bit better. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I don't know if they had to yeah. do more takes or what. Oh, you know what? This one's about him. hockey. So yeah. they probably wrote this for the scene. Whereas, I think the one about the Yellow Jacket boys stealing soda is was also written. <laughs> I don't know that song. You're right. I never heard that one before. You're right. That. The Yellow Jacket Boys is made up. I guess I thought I had this theory prior to knowing that that wasn't their actual name. Yeah. Um, but I thought this scene was just funny in general because has anyone ever poured ashes into a fire? Yeah, it's very, it's a very weird thing. I, I didn't know if that was something I, I didn't know about uh, in it's just, the memorial service world. But it's yeah, just I like, uh, didn't that already happen? Yeah, yeah. You're burning the ashes like refried okay. humans. Maybe maybe that's how he wanted to be spread I mean, out. Yeah. Maybe he was like, throw me into a fire in a back alley. Throw me into a fire, burn me to ashes, and then throw my ashes into fire. <laughs> and yeah, that's the end of the episode. Uh, I loved it. I've really been going back and forth on whether I can give this one an A+. And I think I can. I think, you know the, the, the saying, uh, you're not seeing the forest for the trees? Yeah. I think... I'm giving this an A plus because of the trees, the discussion in the strip club, the wood wooed, mm -hmm. and the generally the yellow jacket boys, but specifically those two scenes I think are some of the funniest in Always Sunny, and for that reason I'm giving it the highest grade possible A plus. Wow, that is impressive. Finally happened, ladies and gentlemen. We have an A plus <laughs> episode. Nate Harrell approved. But, like, really, are you going to take any kind of stock in a guy who moved to fucking Sweden? Think about it. Come on. Yeah. Uh, what do you give this episode, Will? Um, I would say an A+, plus because it featured Charlie, Dennis, Mac, Frank, the waitress, and other people. Classic stuff. Yeah. Also, they were at a strip club. You know, you got to give it bonus right, points right, for that. Right, right, right. Plus, it had the um, reveal someone's watching their dialogue bit maybe the right. first time and it had the reversey yeah yeah it had two really good examples of it yeah well folks uh that's gonna do it for us today because i have to go pick up my dog and will has to uh build a wall or something i'm not sure exactly yeah i'm just gonna head um, down to texas and uh, start building that wall uh and i'm really sorry to have to be leaving in a huff but i gotta leave in a huff so thank you to everyone listening. Thank you to Will Noon. And we will see you next time. Okay, cool. See ya.